Me kala hiki a kala kou, aloha mai kākou. O Thomas Kerig ko ui noa, no New Yorka mai au. He moho lai ulau i ke ke ena kāle o lelo, i ke, ke kula nui o Hawaii i mā noa, kahi e hana ia e kaua tua hine. Ke noho nei i ke one aia li'i o kākuhi hewa ka mokupuni o ahu, maloko o ke avava o pālolo nei, malalo o kaua noe lili le hua. A ole o he kanaka o iwi na kia aina nei, a kā e kako o au i kahahahana a kalahui Hawaii e kūkulu i ke ea i loko o kia pai aina nei. Ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono, e mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. So the questions that are guiding this presentation are ones that I've given a lot of thought uh, over the last few years in planning my dissertation on Hawaiian phonetics. Um, and I suspect that some of these questions um, could apply to other endangered language situations or revitalizing language situations and not just Hawaiian in particular. Um, but for this particular presentation, the questions guiding it are, how should a linguist go about describing the sounds of Hawaiian? Um, in a way that supports the values and goals of the language community. Um, and one adage that um, is repeated often in um, Hawaiian classes and within the community is na naike kumu, which means look to the source. Um, but also kumu has many different meanings. So it means a foundation or a teacher um, or a model or a, even a source or a reason or a goal. Um, so lots of different meanings here, and I'll be touching on some of these as I go. Um, and to start out with, I'm going to be identifying who's Hawaiian um, it's possible to describe um, and why um, I've made the choice to describe certain speakers and how different groups of speakers are positioned in relation to each other. And I'll be going through one particular typology um, by Brensinger and Heinrich. Um, and I also, uh, and then I'm going to be going through some uh, vowel visualizations and describing vowels in a way that I hope is useful um, for teachers and learners in the future. Um, and I'll be basically giving some of my own examples of, of my own uh, research for, for my dissertation. Um, so first of all, I'll be going through uh, just this typology of different Hawaiian speakers. Um, and there's lots that can be uh, said about this and even criticized um, in, in many ways. <laughs> um, but uh, for now, we're going to uh, just go through the individual um, uh, types of speakers as defined by Brensinger and Heinrich, because it is very useful. Um, so the old native speakers, as they call them, are non-Niihau speakers, so not necessarily uh, from the island of Niihau or um, the, uh, the community that lives on the island of Kauai, which I'll go over next. Um, but they did acquire their Hawaiian in childhood um, from their parents or from the surrounding community. Very few of these types of speakers uh, are still alive, um, but we have lots of uh, archival recordings of um, this group of speakers. Um, and we call them mana leo, along with niihau speakers, or another type of mana leo, um, which means that they acquire um, Hawaiian in childhood. Um, very recently, um, more and more English has been um, creeping into the community in childhood. But um, overall, the community has maintained um, the transmission of Hawaiian over the years, in large part due to um, the isolation and the distinctiveness of the community. Um, then we have the pioneer generation, as uh, they're called here, um, the small number of activists at universities um, on the Big Island in Hilo and here in Oahu um, at Manoa, who founded uh, the Hawaiian revitalization movement, really defined the standard um, going forward. And uh, most of these speakers acquired Hawaiian as an L2, um, but in large part from direct contact with old native speakers. Then we have um, by far the largest group of uh, speakers of Hawaiian today, <clears throat> which are L2 speakers. And so we have uh, a large amount of um, acquisition in university classrooms. Um, but as can be expected um, from uh, learning an L2 as an adult, there um, are going to be some transfers from normally English and Pidgin um, as the first languages. Um, and uh, these, uh, the number of speakers is in the several thousands. Um, we also have new native speakers um, 
in many cases, the children of those uh, L2, new fluent L2 speakers um, who learn Hawaiian at school now that we have um, a uh, Hawaiian school system here um, in Hawaii. Um, and we have several hundred, um, probably more than the estimate um, given here, um, of uh, fluent L1 speakers of Hawaiian. Um, but of course, new uh, speech styles have arisen, change has occurred, and more change is going to continue in the future, um, hopefully um, alongside the um, expansion of domains of Hawaiian. Um, but more and more, there's going to be um, very little contact with members of the previous generations who um, did have that, um, <clears throat> that Hawaiian without a break in transmission unless there is, uh, for instance, a lot more contact with the Ni'ihau community or um, uh, it's, it's sort of hard to imagine that there's going to be a, a lot of lot more contact though with those sort of upper, um, those two upper levels of speakers going forward. So in describing and analyzing Hawaiian speech, what should a linguist focus on is, is was my big question when I was learning Hawaiian and realizing that I wanted to do some description of the phonetics of Hawaiian because there was very little literature about it already. And so all of them are worthy of study. A linguist would say, hey, let's look at them all. But um, from the community's perspective, um, they're not looked at equally as um, language models. Um, they're not necessarily as desirable as each other um, for language models. and um, speakers may not be interested even in being compared with one another in certain ways. Um, so for instance, uh, many of these groups of speakers have very high proficiency, but also high linguistic insecurity. They are very self-aware of the fact that there have been transfers um, into Hawaiian from English, um, and many um, will prefer to defer to other um, older nat native speakers, say, look into the archives for um, more authentic speech or talk to somebody from Ni'ihau, because there is this sense um, that um, has been put uh, very succinctly here by Liana Wong, that input from L2 speakers is considered a corrosive force that contaminates the language and um, it weakens its integrity. So this is a really sensitive topic of research, especially for an outside researcher like me, um, to start comparing um, the speech of any of these uh, speakers um, to each other and to old native speakers. It's um, a bit of a sore spot and the community um, itself is really needs to be in the, um, in the driver's seat in terms of choosing um, authentic models. And so when I talk with uh, my own kumu in classrooms and um, talk with members of the community and other students, um, we, I always hear that Ni'ihau speakers um, are very desirable to, um, to use as models. We have several Ni'ihau speakers, um, luckily with us at Manoa um, in the university who are employed as, um, as professors and as speech models in the um, language departments. Um, and even though this uh, community does have a high degree of isolation is, is perceived as a distinct group in this distinct dialect, um, there is a, some, some amount of contact here. Um, and uh, the old, old native speakers that this group that's really um, very few in number now, um, there's hundreds of hours of video and audio archives. And so students actually do end up uh, using these speakers as models in um, many ways as they're assigned in classes, as, as people look through these recordings and, and listen to them. And so even though these represent varieties that do no longer have native speakers in many cases, um, many of the um, people in the community who are learning Hawaiian um, can trace their own ancestry back to these very speakers and to the communities that these speakers were from. And so there's a very um, close connection of in terms of identity and um, in terms of gaining cultural knowledge um, from these speakers and from these wonderful archives. And so um, in going back to those original questions that are, have been guiding me in this presentation is, and as I've been uh, learning Hawaiian and figuring out um, what is my own kuleana, what's my own responsibility and what's my, what are my own uh, limitations and, um, and such uh, in being a phonetician working on Hawaiian. Uh, essentially, uh, as a linguist, I can choose to uh, to make a description that reinforces connections to the people, the, the speakers and the, the speech styles that are looked to by the community as 
models, as language models and sources of, of knowledge. Um, and so going forward, you know, as I, I had this broad goal of creating an acoustic description of Ololo, um, and I decided to go with a description of those old native speakers. Um, and for now, for, for this particular project, um, I'm putting aside data from the eHouse speakers, but those that could certainly be looked at in the future. And specifically, I'm looking at vowel pronunciation. And so <clears throat> the rest of this presentation, we'll be talking a little bit about some of the vowel pronunciation uh, research that I've done. And the data that I've been using comes from um, a radio show, the Kaleo Hawaii, um, that was started by Larry Kimura in 1973 and really kicked off in a lot of ways, was an early catalyst for the Hawaiian language revitalization movement. And this um, archive has been digitized by the Kani Aina project based in Hilo. Um, and uh, several of the interviews have already been transcribed and this is an ongoing project, um, but really a wonderful, um, a run wonderful uh, uh, archive of, of, of content, for uh, analyzing, uh, in my case, um, I got uh, happily got permission from uh, Larry Kimura, who is on my on my committee, and so I've decided on um, an initial sample of eight speakers to look at, um, and of course this can be expanded to other islands and other speakers. Um, this uh, radio show went on for many many years, um, and so far what I've looked at is one uh, male and one female speaker from each of four islands, Kauai, Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii. And so going forward in this presentation, I'll be zooming in a little bit on the speech of two speakers, Alfred Apaka Sr. and Lillian Victor. <clears throat> And I'll be showing some stuff about vowels. So why investigate vowels? Well, the vowel system of Hawaiian is very different from that of English. Um, there's several um, instances where an English speaker um, might uh, have difficulty acquiring um, certain differences. So a versus a or o versus o, which are separate sounds in Hawaiian. Or um, there might be difficulty with these diphthongs, a, i, and i, or specific words um, that might not be pronounced the way that they're spelled. So um, you often hear meikei instead of meikei. Um, and there is a little bit of literature on Hawaiian uh, phonetics and phonology, but um, not very many big multi-speaker descriptions and not much written on variation, um, either within or between speakers or within or between words. Um, and there's unfortunately a lack of learner accessible descriptions. So if you're a student, like I have been for the last few years of Hawaiian and you're interested in pronunciation resources, um, we don't have something that's really searchable or done word by word or sound by sound or speaker by speaker, unlike for instance, for syntax and word, uh, you know, for, for word meanings, we have wonderful newspaper archive we can go to and search through, not really anything yet for pronunciation in that way. But you can also look at vowels uh, as vowel charts and visualize them, which is what I'm going to show you now. So what's a vowel chart? Just to give a little bit of background. Um, you can represent where the tongue is in your mouth as you're producing a vowel. So if your tongue is very front and high and sort of up to the front of your mouth there, then you produce an E. And if it's low and if you go sort of back of your mouth, you get an ah. Um, but also it represents uh, these different vowel formant frequencies that our mind is um, processing to figure out what um, is going on in the speech stream. And phoneticians can plot these on a chart by actually measuring um, spectrograms and measuring these vowel formants. So for instance, an oo has a low formant one and a low formant two, and an e has a low formant one and a high formant two. And an ah has a high formant one and a high formant two. And so we can get tens of thousands uh, of data points from um, our uh, from our, our archives, from the, um, the interviews uh, of Kaleo Hawaii, and actually start plotting these speakers' uh, vowel charts um, together. And so if we look at all of the speakers together, um, all eight of those that I showed before, um, this is the um, short and long vowels of Hawaiian um, together on the same chart. And we see that um, they're sort of spaced out nicely there, except you see that A and E 
the long A and the short A are a little bit different from each other, it looks like. But otherwise, the rest of them sort of look like they overlap a lot. But what I'm going to show you specifically is a couple of different speakers and some particular sounds and words that um, I think might be potentially interesting for, for teachers to use and for learners to use in the future, um, if that's something that um, there's interest in. So if we zoom in here to the E eh versus A, ah, um, for these two speakers, so on the left we have Alfred Apaka and on the right we have Lillian Victor, we have um, the word maika'i or words like loko maika'i and ho'o maika'i. Um, and just that last a ah sound, I've looked here at where in the vowel space is it pronounced. Maika'i. Maika'i. So you can hear, see, you can hear here that it's more of an e eh sound than an a ah sound. It's not maika'i, it's maika'i. Same thing for Lily and Victor. Ho maika'i. Ho maika'i. So it's more of an e eh in maika'i not here in the typical space where the rest of her ah sounds are. Or we can look at the a ah o space. We have words like hope and aale and aole and uh, aohe that can be pronounced as uh, hape, aale, uh, aahe, right? So these have o and a ah sounds in them. Um, and it looks like both of these speakers are producing both forms of the word. So some aahe, some aohe. Um, but what we see here, if we look at the following word after them, is that when there's no word following it, especially for Lillian Victor, it's more likely to have an O pronunciation. So for instance, we have versus. So you hear there's a word after it, vo, so it becomes aale, and it's not aole. Um, here we have the word hope versus hape. Right, so when there's a word following it, a little more likely for it to be the a ah sound than the o oh sound. Looking here at the top of the vowel space, we have um, all of these sounds that might be a little difficult for English speakers um, to distinguish. So we have So I don't know if that's, you can hear that here, but we have o versus o. And then we also have a versus a. 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 And you can really hear the difference and see that it's, for instance, a starts out more towards the a and goes up to e. O starts out more towards o and glides up towards an u. And same thing here with Alfred Apaka. We can listen to his a versus his a. 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 And then the versus is e. B. And same thing in the back. O. Some of these are hard to hear. Oh. Oh. There we go. And then we also have, um, we can look at the diphthongs uh, starting with ah, so a short ah and a long ah. Um, here we see that Alfred Apaka may actually merge um, these two um, sounds, so I and I. 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 But uh, we see that Lily and Victor keeps these pretty separate. I, I, and those are very different I, from I, 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 I. And then we also have the back versions. How, how, how. So we have that shorter O how. that starts in the central part of the vowel space and moves up toward U. We have O that starts lower and moves up toward O. How. And then we have A that starts really low and moves all the way up to the front. Oh. Sorry, all the way up to the um, top and back of the vowel space. Oh. And we can also look at the trajectories of individual words. So like um, we hear a typical A, a. a. and a typical I. I. Um, and we hear that the word Layla, for instance, Layla. which is spelled with an A-E, is pronounced more like an A-E. And we can see that here on the chart here. Um, the words meaning uh, sibling, so kaikua anna, kaiku mahine, um, are spelled like an A-E, but pronounced more like an A, because you can hear here. It's more like an A sound a. rather than an I sound. A. And so we can actually chart these and, and also put, uh, put sound to them. Hello. So um, the reason that uh, I think this all might be 
um, useful and of interest perhaps to teachers and learners is because it's been shown uh, that visual feedback does bolster learning um, of a second language alongside ear training and classroom instruction. Um, and this has been shown a lot by uh, with prosody. So um, it's easy to show the ups and downs of your tone of voice. Um, and some amount of research has also looked at this in vowel charts. It seems to also help um, learners of a second language. Um, and so specifically in this case, what this is calling attention to are these subtle but really important differences uh, between vowels that might not be immediately obvious uh, to the ear or in the mouth of a, of a new speaker of Hawaiian. They show really clearly some variation between and within words and between and within speakers. And this, I think, can really enhance a teacher's toolkit in explaining pronunciation going forward. So my takeaways, again, um, to those original questions of how could a linguist, in my case, a phonetician, go about describing Hawaiian in a way that supports the values of the community. Well, if we, if we na na ike kumu, if we look to the source, um, we have different kumu, different models um, that are looked to in different ways by the community. And so we can make a choice to, uh, to, to really prioritize the description of those voices, so mana leo. Um, we can investigate uh, questions that have the potential to help kumu in the classroom, to, to help teachers. And of course, the kumu, the reason for all of this is the revitalization of Hawaiian. And so as a linguist, even though I might be interested in all of these different varieties of Hawaiian and um, take a certain, uh, have a certain position in terms of that, it's really, um, it's, it, it's, it's a, a really moral obligation to make sure that the community is in the driver's seat and to pay attention to the sources that the community is interested in paying attention to uh, first and foremost. So here are uh, some of my references. Um, mahalo i ko o ko olohe ana mai. Um, uh, thank you for listening and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Mahalo.